Thank you very much, Alice. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the British American Business Business Briefing on the power of partnerships for tech innovation, how startups help establish brands escalate innovation. Well, let me first of all offer my respect to Alice, Emma, and Lindsay from the BAB team that you can see on screen, as well as to the Capita team, in particular Fabian, who you can also see for putting time and resources into the session. Um, let me also acknowledge our CEO, Duncan Edwards, who is with us um, on, uh, in this session, as well as a number of BAB colleagues who have joined from both sides of the Atlantic for this meeting. I, was, I have to admit, I was quite keen and in a way imposed myself to open and host the session myself because I wanted to offer my personal endorsement to what we are going to experience today uh, in this briefing. This, this event really for me is a reflection of, you know, when we speak about the Transatlantic Corridor, we speak about often about established brands, but we also need to think about those who disrupt and help established brands disrupt the market and innovate. Um, so we are going to speak about that. Secondly, we're going to speak about how is this going to work? How does that work? And we'll talk about the partnerships that are being created between companies that have a new idea, a new product, and then can help an established company or a company that has an existing product indeed disrupt and innovate further. And thirdly, um, in addition to, to, um, to uh, what I've just mentioned, what, what I think the session will really uh, show us is an idea and fascinating examples of how tech innovation, especially AI and AR driven marketing and consumer experience um, really changes the, the life for companies and us as, as consumers. So. Uh, I mentioned to Chris from Raymond Rogers already in the pre-briefing, um, you have a lot of fans in our team and we are so excited to learn more about your product and how you use actually augmented reality to create a consumer experience that is different from what we have seen now and before. Um, but long story short, um, I, let me say a big thanks to our colleagues from Capita, a great partner of our network. Um, we are so grateful to have you part of our network. Thanks to all the speakers who I will not introduce, and thanks to what I think is an extremely fascinating and diverse group of people today. I think, you know, you all should look into the briefing papers or into the chat where a colleague of mine will send a list shortly of everyone who's joined this meeting. Um, it's a fantastic group of people, different, different kind of people, different parts of the com of companies, and also different companies on both sides of the Atlantic. Really, really good um, and also very appropriate for this session today. Um, we are really proud um, to be doing this with all of you together. So pleasing to say, enjoy. And I'm delighted now to hand over to Paul Fox, Growth Director at Capital. Great, thanks, Emmanuel. And uh, great to be with you and the extended uh, BAB community today. Um, I got the pleasure of moderating uh, this afternoon's uh, discussion. Uh, we're gonna focus on the power of partnership for technology innovation. Um, how startups help establish brands escalate innovation. So it's a pretty broad uh, discussion and one which we think uh, we've got the opportunity to bring you some really great insights from across a pretty diverse cross-section um, of people. Um, uh, my name is Paul Fox. I'm the growth director within Capita's customer management division. Um, customer management, for those of you that are not familiar with, with our organization, represents about a third of Capita's uh, 3.6 billion pounds of annualized revenue. And we derive that from a mix of consulting, digital and transformation services across both the public and private sectors, uh, predominantly within the UK, but we've got businesses that extend across Central Europe um, and we've got offshore capabilities into um, uh, India and South Africa that support our business capabilities. Uh, whilst Capita have got a really broad breadth of uh, capabilities and offerings, we've seen huge value in our scaling partner business or CSP. Um, CSP provides investment into corporate venture partnerships with scale up businesses, um, providing next generation uh, SaaS software as a service uh, platforms and capabilities to the marketplace. Um, this acts as an incubator um, for innovations um, and the CSP platform allows Capita to really focus on our core client engagements whilst providing an extended set of capabilities 
um, around innovation in a genuinely agile manner to the marketplace that we serve. Um, today I'm joined by two of our scaling partners, uh, Michael, uh, who's the CEO of uh, London Dynamics, um, and David, who's the co-founder of Dragonfly AI, as well as uh, leading behavioral change and customer experience writer, uh, Jennifer, um, who will be supporting the discussion. And last, but certainly not least, uh, we have Chris Reynolds, who's the uh, managing director of uh, Braymont Watches, who will give a detailed customer perspective. And I think as always already been mentioned, I think has a number of fans within the audience today because of the interest in his products. Um, I'll ask each of the contributors to give a bit more of a specific outline of their um, business capabilities and interests as we step into the discussion. So they'll give you a bit more color about what they're doing and what sits behind the businesses as we go through. Um, so on to the discussion itself, I think that if I look at what we're going to talk about, I really genuinely don't think that there has been a more appropriate time to um, dig into this topic. Um, whilst disruptive digital change has been dominating the corporate culture for well over a decade, the socio-political impacts of COVID-19 have pushed the warp speed button on a number of these trends. Um, we're seeing as move forward as much as five to 10 years in certain digital categories within the space of a matter of months during 2020. So the prescience in terms of the change agenda that we're all facing, whether that be within public or private sector, is extremely um, vivid right now. If I consider within my own organization, um, from a divisional perspective, we shifted from having 1% of our 40,000 people working, who were working from home in January 2020 to a position whereby we'd migrated close to 70% of our workforce into work from home location by April. And when you consider that the vast majority of our people are working within contact center environments, that was a considerable pivot in terms of the operating model and the behavior of our business. Um, and whilst this number will balance, I think the CBI predict that there's likely to be about 47% of businesses that will have blended home and uh, office-based operating models in the future. And separate research suggests that one in five office buildings will no longer be need needed as we come through uh, the, the full effects of the pandemic. So there's really significant structural change that's taking place across businesses, regardless of the platform of um, operations that they run. Online commerce for fashion categories had a relatively modest 20% market share in January of 2020. And that market share um, had been slowly accruing. Um, it was 16% back in 2016. By May of 2020, this had doubled uh, and it had got to 45% uh, market share. So the shift in terms of the use of technology and the behavior through which uh, people have to engage both with business context and technology context has just cycled at a rapid and accelerated rate of knots. And I think that all organizations therefore need to embrace customer service technology um, in a quick time to value um, in order to change the way that they can service customers within the marketplace. But I think that the real challenge is how can organizations pivot and be agile enough to navigate what has been completely unpredictable and a continually frenetic pace of change? And critically, how do you support customers and citizens who've come to expect a seamless digital journey? Um, an experience that's of the type that has been set in stone by the likes of Google and Netflix and Uber. Um, this type of change requires faster and faster innovation cycles. Um, it requires fast iteration, and fundamentally, it requires fast failure. Um, and so for organizations with really 
heavy legacy analog infrastructure, build is really too slow um, of a change momentum to be able to bring platforms into their customer base. So the intention of the discussion uh, with our panel today is to explore how more innovative partnerships and agile engagement to market can help to stimulate and support the type of change that we're um, advocating is taking place in the marketplace. Um, we got the opportunity to take questions as we go through the discussion. Um, I think that there's a chat function that will be running throughout and I will do my level best to try to pick them up as they come through. And Emmanuel has assured me that he'll rescue me if I miss any of them, um, but please feel free to do that. And we've also allocated some space at the back end of the discussion um, to be able to accommodate any Q&A uh, that we would like to take. But the intention is that this is by the very nature of the technology platforms that we're describing, uh, a relatively informal engagement. So we would welcome your interaction um, and the opportunity for you to join in the discussion. Um, but we would also be available um, after the discussion uh, to provide any further information that might help you to understand the topic more clearly. So first of all, I'll come to uh, Jennifer. Um, would you like to, first of all, Jennifer, maybe just give a quick introduction to yourself, your background and, and, and your current role? Sure. Um, well, I think appropriate to this group, I am what you might call a British American myself. So I am joining you from the UK, but obviously you can tell from my accent, I come, I hail from the United States of America. Uh, and in terms of background, I mean, I, it's really been a mix for me of client side and, and sort of agency consulting side. Basically, I specialize in uh, behavior change, behavioral science, um, sort of strategy. So that in my career has spanned everything from you know, working corporate innovation at AT&T, like as a client, uh, going across the aisle and working with brands like McDonald's all over the globe, uh, now in the UK, Lloyd's Banking Group and Compare the Market. And I've, I've been lucky enough to work in a lot of places, obviously the UK and the US, but also spent some time in Australia working across uh, some Asian brands as well. But I'd, I think most notably for this group recently, I, um, I wrote a book called Choice Hacking, which is all about how you can use behavioral science to help people uh, sort of adapt these new digital ways of working and sort of what are those basic uh, fundamental unchanging principles of psychology and behavioral science that we can use in times that uh, are changing, as they say. Great, thanks, Jennifer. And can, can you start us off just by giving some color in terms of the types of shift that I've described taking place within the market has been really unprecedented. We had no ability to understand that the changes that were coming would take place in the way that they did. So from a, a consumer perspective, do you think that those changes um, are uh, likely to be um, permanent in terms of the way that people start to um, uh, apply their um, uh, change behaviors? Or do you think that this is something that's much more temporary? I mean, it's a good question, right? And I don't think anybody really knows the answer, but I think it's probably some combination of some things will change and some things will stay the same. I think we like to talk a lot about the unchanging man or woman, um, and this is an ideal uh, from Bill Birnbach, who was like a legendary advertising uh, man by, way back in the 60s. And he had this idea that, you know, it's taken millions of years for people to evolve where we are now. So the idea that something that's happened over the last 12 months would fundamentally change how we behave 100 percent is probably a little exaggerated. Right. But some things definitely have um, created pressure for customers. Some behaviors have changed. So, for example, I mean, we've talked about digital adoption, but specifically things like QR codes, which for a very long time as a customer experience designer myself were sort of the bane of my existence because you would hear people bring them up and we'd say, well, nobody's gonna use a QR code because people just don't wanna learn how to do it. They're confused. Like, how do you explain to somebody who isn't you know, young and sort of used to that, how to use a QR code? Well, here in the UK, now you go into a shop and you have to scan a QR code. So everyone has been forced to sort of adopt this behavior and that is an example of something that now once people have learned how to do it, they're much more willing to kind of continue doing that in the future. So I think that's also true of things like um, alternative customer journeys, so like click and collect. And you know anything that's digital, obviously people have had to pivot to really quickly. 
And interestingly, you know, in the past, a lot of digital journeys were where the friction was. So people are like, I'd much rather just go into a store. It's easier. I can look around. I can pick something up. But now, because of a lot of risk factors, you know, customers really want control. They want safety. They want efficacy in their customer journeys. And for a lot of people, that is in the digital journey now. So if you think about, you know, going to a Target in the U.S. or like the Sainsbury's here, you know, now you have extreme queuing in a way that you never would have before. So a lot of people who are, you know, in demographics that may not be as, you know, let's say native to digital or, or maybe like would prefer to go into the store rather than use maybe a click and collect service or a delivery service are now onboarded to that way of behaving. And these tend to be, you know, older, more affluent groups of customers. So I think to see groups like that sort of, you know, be taken on to different ways of um, experiencing you know, businesses and interacting with them, I think you will start to see some of those things um, kind of stick around. But I, I hate to commit to one thing or another. I think I'm maybe a little less aggressive than some people, but I do think you'll see a little bit of a, a move back to where we were, but you'll see a lot of people kind of keep those behaviors going. Do, do you think the force towards the use of technology, though, has a level of permanence to it? So you talked about QR codes as an example of, you know, a technology that was there, but maybe not one that became a more permanent adoption. Do, you know, I mean, have we shifted, you know, beyond the kind of millennial demographic that we're very comfortable with this and started to break into generations of people that will engage with technology in a more ready fashion? I think absolutely, because I think that is always the issue. Like, so I come from a marketing background, a product innovation background, product development, and the hardest thing to do is to get somebody to either break an existing habit or build a new one. So trial is incredibly difficult. So if you have now a group of people who you know, tend to be more affluent, they tend to shop more, they tend to spend more, and now they're preferring a digital channel, which for a lot of businesses is a good thing. It's a higher margin channel. Um, it's easier to deliver. It's a better experience overall. I think that's really good news for the businesses that have done a digital transformation. It's probably not great news for the ones that are still kind of struggling to sort of get there. But I think you know that's where the opportunities for partnerships come in is to help those big sort of Titanic boats make a shift in direction. Whereas like COVID has definitely, you know, it's gotten people to think in that way and start to do that. I, I think COVID is never gonna get rid of the fact that it is really hard to transform a company. It's really difficult to do. They may have sped it up, but they're always gonna need partnerships and sort of, uh, you know, partners to come in and help them do that. And, and do you think that partnership engagement um, is something that is essential to inform in the speed with which they can change? Or is it about trying to inject the innovation point into an organization because maybe there's a, a kind of a, a, maybe a cultural legacy of operating in a particular way? I think it can be both. Um, you know, and I'll speak from my experience being in a big, I mean, you can't really get much older or much bigger in the US than at and right? It's 300,000 people when I worked there. I was working in corporate innovation. It was, it was such a, an interesting thing to see how we would have partners come in. And you're right, they would inject sort of that innovative way of thinking, but then sometimes it would get into the organization and just die because it's a big organization. But I think now because you have that additional sort of advantage or, or lever of COVID, now having those new ideas and those new capabilities come into an organization, they're finding much more fertile ground because people know that they have to change the, I mean, the writing is on the wall. And obviously I can't speak, it's been a while since I've been at that company, but I can speak to the fact that, you know, the, the bigger the company, the harder it is to turn. But I think the cultural pressure and the pressure of COVID has just made people more and more willing to kind of need and to, to seek out those partners. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Jen, I'm going to um, ask David maybe to, to, to join the conversation at that point. Um, David, would you be able to do the same and, and just give some context in terms of your background and uh, where, where you, uh, you you came to the business that is Dragonfly? Yeah, certainly. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here today. So my name is David Mitchell. I'm one of the co-founders of Dragonfly AI. <clears throat> my background primarily has been in tech startup. So I've run quite a few tech innovation startup companies. And about two years ago, we partnered up with CSP <clears throat> and so far, you know, it's been a fantastic journey. And I, I think, you know, I'm liking the fact that we're using the word digital transformation already so much in this session, because I think that is the main topic here. It's, you know, speed to market, digital transformation. It's, it's how do we bring these new digital marketing technology and innovation? How do we bring it to the table? How do we create the value 
for the brands and the people that we speak to. So, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a startup addict um, and I love tech innovation. So <clears throat> anything that touches how we improve customer engagement ultimately. So, so can you bring maybe a bit of colour to the types of things that um, Dragonfly do and maybe use that by way of illustration for this shift from a physical to digital um, world and how that can be translated into a solution for customer demand and customer requirements, David? Yeah, certainly. Well, you know, we're, we're quite fortunate for, for a small young business that we work with some of the world's biggest, you know, brands already. Uh, and I think the term that I've heard people use most often recently for us is that we're really relevant right now because everybody shifted from online to offline. The world of, you know, what brand is not trying to do direct to consumer at the moment. So I think it's it's a really big shift. And, and sometimes these big companies, then they're, they're not able to actually pivot that quickly to these new channels. So, you know, I, th I think when we set out to do this, one of the main reasons was that, you, you know, consumers are swamped with content. They're seeing it across more channels than ever before. There's more content available. And these brands have to cut through. They have to make sure that their, their messaging, their pricing, their branding, it's actually getting the attention of the consumers that are, that are seeing it. So traditionally, they would have used eye tracking studies, human-based research panels, lots of insights. And then what they would do is, is model that back in and say, right, okay, well, let's run a test a different way next time. So they're always doing things after the event. And at Dragonfly, we predict the performance of content across any channel, but we, we do it in real time. We're actually doing it before you publish the content. And I think that's the most important thing. If we can help predict the performance of content, we're going to improve the effectiveness of any comms channel, any marketing content that these brands are producing. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's just so relevant right now to have something that can help improve really the experience of the end consumer. And I guess when you're talking about bringing that type of platform into a business, the speed with which you need to um, put that in place and enable it to be able to uh, translate into something that there are, there's business value coming back from is, is, is critically important. So, you know, how, how, how quickly can something be scaled? How quickly can it be put into an organization that's maybe had a, a very established platform of engagement to market? Yeah, it's a very good question. And, you know, we've made our products really easy to use, really easy to access, but most importantly, really easy to get the insights back straight away and i think that's the speed to market that you're referencing you know they people want the insight quickly so that they can make an informed decision about what to do next and and i think that's the way you know we've got the power of using ai which of course is you know extremely powerful it's very relevant very real time at the moment and and i think for a brand they can very easily quickly use use our tools to measure the content and very quickly change what they need to so optimize it uh for, you know for the most for really to, to grab the most attention they can are, are there technology barriers would you say in terms of bringing that type of innovation into an organization that's that, that's particularly got a, a, a legacy of, of kind of quite strong uh, you know analog infrastructure yeah we sometimes but I, i'll be honest with you you know some some of the not more advanced companies, but some of the bigger companies are definitely embracing AI. You know, they, they have to bring it into their tech stack. And I think these days it is a lot easier to enable these technologies with APIs. You can just plug things in. And I think, you know, data protection and, and how we manage the use of data, I think, is improving. So feeding something like this into a workflow is a lot easier, much easier than it used to be. And I think as well as that creates a lot of operational uh, efficiencies when you're putting AI in because things are, the results and the insights are being produced a lot quicker. But, but do you think that there is still a, a, a kind of a reticence or do you think, you know, and I, I'm, I'm thinking back to the, the points that I made at the start of the discussion and my sort of reflection on the marketplace is that a lot of organizations have been driven to a point where they need to look at how they can re-engage with their, um, their, their customers because they're simply in a different position than they were 18 months ago, literally, in terms of the, the, the geographical positioning that they're in. And so, you know, is it, a, is it a compelled event that's driven or do you think that this was a, a, a model of change that was happening that's now just been accelerated? Yeah, 
it's exactly that point. It's just been accelerated, you know, that literally brands are forced to now engage on different channels. You know, you, you've got to look at the, the increase of, you know, social commerce. It's going to be a huge, great channel. Look, look at the increase of, you know, esports and how you can now buy almost anything inside a game in VR and AR. I mean, it's, it's a very powerful route to market, but you've got to have the tools in place to enable you to deliver um, the messaging or, or whatever you need to, to your consumers. And where does the market go for you beyond this, do you think, David? You know, so, so you didn't expect what you saw in 2020, but how does that shift now as you go through 21 and beyond? Yeah, I mean, I think to Jen's point as well, you know, we, we've seen that trend to online without, without a doubt. And, you know, our analysis that, that, that our customers are doing every day proves that. But, you know, we, we will go back into stores. We, we will be able to see content across on the shelf again and pick it up. So I, I think I think we're going to we're just going to have to think about it as any content, any channel and, and the ability to, you know, match that as as consumers reengage in, in different ways. I think. The other area, the most exciting area for us probably is 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 the next generation. You know, we are being asked to engage with VR now. You know, how do you interact with consumers when they're in a VR experience? You know, and that people want to think, you know, brands are thinking about how how to how are they going to commercialize that? So, you know, again, there's there's we're in this now, but I think there will be a future trend of moving to new technologies as well as bringing some of the old ones back. Yeah, yeah. David, I'm going to maybe move to, to Michael um, and bring you into the conversation at this point, if I may. Um, Michael, could, could you just give, give a bit of background? I think some, some very interesting perspective from um, your previous organisation and how that's kind of translated into uh, the work that you're doing at London Dynamics now. Yeah, so uh, nice to meet you guys. I, uh, I'm an old corporate rat who turned startup. You can say so I jumped uh, jumped out of the plane a few uh, few uh, years ago. So I spent almost uh, two decades uh, at IKEA, uh, uh, heading up that digital innovation. And during that work, one of the things we did was uh, we launched uh, IKEA Place, which is uh, like the first. It was the first commercial application of uh, augmented reality. And Tim Cookie became a personal fan, brought it on Good Morning America, and invited me to New York to launch it with him. And then I thought, okay, if I can get Tim Cook excited about some technology we clamped together in 10 weeks, I should probably start myself. So I did that and we founded London Dynamics. And basically what we do is we offer anybody in the world who wants to go into augmented reality, we, all, we offer this platform. So augmented reality is basically a way of interacting with the real world and you superimpose your real um, uh, item, but in digital format uh, through your phone. And uh, yeah, you're going from a two-dimensional experience, which is what everybody does uh, online, right? You have the screen and you look at it and you can interact with it into a three-dimensional experience where you look through the phone and you engage with the real world at the same time and the digital object. And this is just the beginning, like augmented reality. I've said there's a few things that's going to determine our future. Artificial intelligence self-driving cars, robotics, and augmented reality. And this is just the beginning. And basically we are set out to be the, 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 the YouTube of uh, augmented reality. That's, uh, that's what we do. So we allow anybody who wants this experience to plug and play into our backend. And, and your experiences through, through 2020, uh, Michael, in terms of the speed with which um, engagement with market changed. Yes, so I can, I can say it from two angles. On one angle, we, I put together a world-class uh, team of uh, tech engineers to build a platform. We have really good uh, capacity. I've been a retailer for 20 years. I understand consumer behavior pretty good, um, but we were not very good in the business development uh, side. So I would say one thing on the, on the scaling part now, on the partner side, you cannot survive in the world today by yourself. It used to be that big brands and big companies could do it by themselves. Nobody can no more, not even a, a, a startup or scale up. So the partnership with Capita really drive, you can say the professional side of our business development. So I don't know if, 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 if that is to uh, give credit or if it's to the market or maybe a little bit of both. But I do feel, yeah, first of all, we're picking up incredible speed in conversations. Brands are much more engaged now and prepared to talk about augmented reality just compared to one year ago. And uh, yeah, we're getting our plate uh, full pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. 
Je Jennifer, could, could I bring you into that a little bit? Because I guess the, the, the concept of augmented reality in terms of the psychological adoption and, 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 and ability to identify with a brand that is virtual, you know, does consumer behavior connect as well with procurement in that type of format? And how does that, how does that kind of bridge work? Sorry, so how are customers adopting VR? Yeah, and I guess from a behavioral perspective in terms of their comfort with a, a procuring in that sort of virtual mode. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one, right? Because like with any technology, you follow the adoption curve, right? You'll have some people who are instantly comfortable and they're happy to do it. And that's great, but they're going to be on the bleeding edge. But I think we're at the point now, specifically with VR, where we're beyond that point, right? Like, I think people are actually hungry for, um, you know, interacting with brands or being able to shop kind of in that virtual environment, which, you know, I, I'm, I'm bullish on retail as well. But I think just the reality of what's going to happen over the next couple of years is we're going to have to be in some kind of hybrid environment. And people will definitely be more open, more willing to try um, technologies where they can start to you know, think about things like, I mean, furniture is a great example, like going into a virtual environment to see how things will fit in the house and how they'll work together and all of that. I think clothing, I mean, if you talk to anybody um, who, I wouldn't call myself a big shopper, so I was definitely a shopper. I love to go in and touch and feel, like be in the store and try on stuff. I mean, you really, you miss that. And if you can't do it, because again, this goes back to sort of the psychological needs of customers at the minute, to feel safe, to feel in control, I think, Technologies like VR are going to find, um, again, you know, that fertile ground that they may not have in the past like few years and sort of following that momentum now that's, that started with COVID, I think it can only kind of accelerate from here. Yeah. Can I just uh, add, uh, add on to that? Because you can say like if you look at uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. So virtual reality, you are in a complete different world. You have a mask on. You can see nothing in the real world. And it's a pretty uh, transformable uh, experience uh, for cognitive uh, uh, therapy and all kinds of use cases in gaming. Augmented reality, you're still in the real world and you're looking through a device and you see a digital object. And this is where um, like you get the liberation back from the, from the confinement of the screen. So instead of just looking at your screen, you're now in the real world engaging with the real world. And I would say like if e-commerce should evolve, like the technical aspect of e-commerce is just like in, in America and, and, and in the UK, it works top notch. You can get almost any item you want within 24 hours, uh, good price, uh, uh, reliable, all those sort of things. So all the technicalities of shopping online has been solved. But where is the aspiration? Where is the emotions? Where is the inspiration that you crave when you're walking down the high street? Not only do you feel, feel part of life, you feel rich, you are engaging with the world, but you also get like an emotional connection with the products that you touch. And this is what we now bring uh, online, just like a Zoom is a pretty good, it's not it's not as good as a real meeting, but it, 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 it's getting pretty efficient, right? And, uh, and augmented reality is kind of like, uh, giving that uh, element to the world uh, at the moment. And do you think that there are limitations though, in terms of the types of um, product engagements that you can, um, benefit from using yes <laughs> yes clothes everybody want to solve clothes it's not solved i i don't believe that it will be solved anywhere in the next few years because it's super complicated to trust the fit of something you put on virtually exactly how is the fabric gonna fall is it gonna be like my size it's it's almost impossible at the moment so anything which is like a singular, uh, like a, a single product, uh, hard items, uh, something you want to size up. Like if you're buying a Louis Vuitton bag, you know, you can maybe just look at the picture and get a good understanding. But if you understand, oh, it's 46 centimeters high, you know, what is that really? But if you then place it in front of you, then you really get the experience of understanding uh, how big it is and, and all of the details. I think those items are going to come first. But trust me on this one, augmented reality and, and commerce is just the beginning. Like uh, if you if you go fast forward, I don't know, five year, 10 year, 20 year, first of all, everybody's going to have augmented reality uh, from a commerce perspective, but you're also going to not care anymore what is on your wall because whatever you see doesn't have to physically be there. So it's like, uh, you know, first you're going to have glasses. But now we have a phone, then you're going to have glasses. Then you maybe have an implant. You maybe have a light projection. And then it doesn't matter to you at a certain point of time 
if it's there, if it's not there, because your experience of it is there. And I feel like augmented reality, like with the Brahman watches, is a good example of where it becomes so real. It's really, really hard to tell the difference between the real thing and a digital imposed uh, item. I think probably a perfect segue to bring you in, Chris, if I can. Uh, to, 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 uh, and we didn't even rehearse that, Michael. So that's. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if, if you could, similar to, to the, the past uh, presenters, Chris, just, just give a bit of colour in terms of uh, your background and role. Um, and then it would be really interesting to give some views from, from an a, a, a organisational perspective, how this has been uh, brought value to your business. Yeah, okay, so background um, to me briefly first. So I, I'm M MD at Bremont, I've been here for two years now. Um, so it's been dominated by the last 12 months quite significantly. Um, prior to that, I was predominantly from a, originally an IT and then engineering um, backgrounds. And so I, I joined Bremont to support with our ambitions to bring more manufacturing and technical engineering processes in-house because we're making more and more of our product here. Um, um, a small aside, you made a comment, Paul, about the uh, the moving away from offices and large um, complexes and facilities. We moved into this brand new facility last week. <laughs> it's 35,000 square feet. Um, so timing's perfect. It's completely empty. Apart from me here, the lights going off because they're on, a, they're automatic, and I don't know how to work them yet. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, so that's that's a small aside. Um, so yeah, coming into uh, Bremont, uh, we are, as I mentioned, on a mission to reinvent the British watch industry. It, it historically, was the leader in the manufacturing of well, um, the world's watches and clocks. Um, these days, not, not so much. Everyone thinks Swiss, um, but it wasn't originally. Actually, the inventions came from. Um, from here. So um, trying, to, trying to do our bit to reinvigorate that. So 12 months ago, well, 11 months ago, um, we all know things took a bit of a, um, a challenging turn for, uh, for retail businesses um, and all businesses, actually. Um, and we needed to look to a um, uh, kind of digital, to, to look towards digital transformation to help realize sales. And could you talk a little bit about the use of AR within the, the kind of positioning to market? How long have you kind of used that technology? Are you able to see it in a tangible sales sense in terms of how it's impacted, Chris? Yeah, so I'll be honest. So a year ago when we needed to um, rethink what we we're doing, um, one of the testament to the team we've got here, and um, I think there's a couple of um, tech, obviously, um, comments been made before about um, uh, change in larger businesses potentially but here we've got a small team and we needed to adapt quite quickly so it's a bit of a brainstorming session um, the business here is, is we run things on a, on a Monday um, we kick them at the week off with a Monday top three meeting we call it we move those to have them every day and that they were dominated by what can we do on our website what else can we what um, innovation what how, how can we make our website more interesting to our clients how we've got so many incredible video assets and think we're talking about how all these crazy ideas um one of those crazy not so crazy ideas was augmented reality um and that led to a a kind of a a, a a reach out around various companies to see who we could find that would be able to support us introduce augmented reality um, onto our site. Um, so I work with, a, with the two co-founders here who are very skeptical um, about the quality that we'd be able to secure from the development of an of a augmented reality asset. So that was one of our biggest challenges. Um, selling a luxury timepiece for 5,000 pounds, 10,000 um, pounds, it has to um, reflect the quality and the, the, the craftsmanship that we put into it. So yeah, that's so augmented reality was something we looked for, and we then uh, um, were fortunate enough to find London Dynamics who helped us with that. And the speed in terms of how that's been applied into your business, can you talk about you know from those ideas that, that you described to, to the point where you're putting it into uh, real um, you know active engagement to the marketplace? How quickly did that work? And also maybe just to talk about how this fits into your overall. Uh, channel strategy and how important mm -hmm. websites and, and digital online engagement has become versus other mediums? Well, um, okay, so this, the, the, the background context, so we've seen our web, 
traffic um, uh, increased 30%. Um, we've, uh, we've seen a 210% growth um, in e-commerce um, year on year. So it's, so it's, it's worthwhile putting the time in. Um, what we found, we were able to create augmented, augmented reality assets in, com in combination with London Dynamics quite quickly. The quality control piece probably took the most time because we're going backwards and forwards because it needs to be perfect. So, you know, we, there's aspects of the dial or the hands that will be slightly different or the lighting was probably the most complex um, side of it, trying to get the lighting right. Um, so actually creating the assets was was imp impressively quick. Um, if anything, that our rollout of it, if you look around our website, we have a handful of watches which use augmented reality at the moment. It's a it's a watch by watch, case by case project. We've somewhat held it back. One of the um, key innovations we looked to introduce was um, the watch configuration tool. So on our website, you're able to um, reconfigure one of our watches um, choosing different colors and, and, and um, case materials and various design features. Um, one of the cool things we thought about that was, wow, okay, what if you can configure your watch and then see it in augmented reality? Um, there's an extension from this, which we're trying to find, um, get a solution for, which is then to see it on your wrist live in a browser, which no one's solved that problem yet, by the way, techie people fix it for us. Um, so um, at the moment you would, it's possible right now, and there's uh, examples out there, Gucci do it for one, but it's, you have to download an app. So trying to get in browser tech that can do that, that'd be good. Um, but so yeah, to, to, to seek to configure and then see them, there's 2,176 variants that London Dynamics are kindly creating um, dynamically um, for us through that um, uh, through the um, uh, our platform. So, so timing wise, that's so that we we've somewhat held them up a bit by that <laughs> two thousand plus asset request. Fantastic. I, I just want to add uh, something really quick. Uh, sorry, Paul and uh, Chris. It's just uh, because it looks like in the beginning of the journey. Like first of all, we took the detail of this uh, AR products, uh, I, I can proudly say it's definitely at the highest level that uh, you can get anywhere. And we know it because we work with Apple and, and those guys and, and, and they don't reach this level. And there was a combination between the designer of Bremont and our 3D designers. But in the beginning, it might look a little small, but soon Chris is gonna have thousands of watches in AR uh, on his website that you can engage with. I, I, I pasted one of them just so you can have a look uh, after this uh, call, obviously. Uh, but uh, but as soon as uh, Apple, they're going to release or we're going to release or somebody's going to release a uh, try on for watches, uh, Bremont, they're going to have the possibility to try on thousands of watches from day one. And everybody else is going to wake up and go like, oh, my God, what happened to my e-commerce uh, shop here? You know, all the competitors are going to be left behind. So it takes a little time. But if you want to get pristine quality, uh, then, uh, you know, it, it, you have to put in a little bit of effort. Yeah, it takes time. So as, as um, uh, the uh, part of the question earlier was actually how does it form form part of what we're doing for the for the channel? So um, to kind of take away slightly from the leading edge tech stuff that we've been talking about, some of the basic um, improvements in around live chat and uh, video chats and co-browsing have dominated um, the past uh, kind of twelve months as well as features we've introduced on the website. At the end of the day, the, the point here is what we're trying to do is replicate the real world in life experience through your phone or, or tablet screen or whatever. So anything you can do to allow someone to immerse themselves in the in, in your product and your brand and your story um, is obviously going to help. Um, the question you, you put a question in amongst there about have we seen it has there been a commercial advantage i think it's quite difficult if i'm honest to really pin it i think michael would want me to say yes of course but um it's quite difficult really for you to put your finger on and say yeah they've we've secured this many additional watch sales because of that um it all just i think some of it just lends to a bit of a brand identity i mean if you are do you want to come across as someone who is willing to push push things a little bit and try new things and show and allow new experiences for your client it, it says a lot about and i think it just plays to the general sentiment. Um, but clearly um, for the one of the key things for us is understand sizing. If you're looking at 
um, deciding whether or not to put a, a wardrobe or a, or a chest of drawers or whatever. And, and it's all about the sizing. Does it fit on you in your room? But a watch is a similar feed. You, you want to know if it's how the size fits and see how you feel about the, the sizing of that particular time. Because um, that, that particular time piece, not everyone can know for sure that 43 mil is this size and 39 mil is that size and so on. But um, yeah, so it's just, it's all about that, that, just creating that real world experience as much as, you, as well as you can. And, and, and I might just, sorry, sorry, Paul. I might just add a little behavioral science thing here. So Chris, I'm not surprised that you can't necessarily like draw a direct line to sales at the minute. But interestingly, there's a behavioral science mechanic called the endowment effect. It basically says that when people own something, they attribute more value to it. And actually I was studying it, Michael, coincidentally, um, just how Ikea uses it. The fact that Ikea has these huge stores, so you're more likely to put something in the cart. And they find that when you put something in the cart in the same way, if you try it on, even in augmented environments, the endowment effect will start to kick in. So people start to feel like they own it and they don't want to give it up. So I think that's really interesting, but this is, sorry, some color commentary from the behavioral science person over here. No, it's a super good uh, comment, uh, Jennifer. And I was uh, thinking about also when we talk about dwell time and online uh, uh, eyeballing, like the average time on a high ticket item on, uh, on the platform is four minutes. Like where do you get engagement of your product for four minutes? Uh, like you really have to be in a physical store. You don't get that anywhere else online. And the, and the, and the, the lowest level is like two minutes. So talking about behavioral change, that's definitely a good online uh, eyeballs. <laughs> Very true. Good, online, good online eyeballs. That's uh, that, I think that's the quote of the day. Is that um, if, if you go beyond the the, the experiences of twenty twenty, Chris? Do you, do you see that the the um, adjacency to your um, uh, store and your physical retail um, activities? Do, do you see that as being um, something that accelerates your investments into AR to try and drive further engagement into store? How do you see that that kind of translation as you go out of this particular event that we're in now? Um, uh, so I think there's probably some helpful context to, to, to put here. So the watch industry, so this industry, and I appreciate everyone's slightly different, it's different has its nuances. Um, we were early adopters to e-commerce in September 2018, right? So when you put that, you think that's a bit bizarre, isn't it? Early adopters at the end of 2018. Um, very few watch brands in the traditional sense, unless you were coming out of the blocks as a pure play e-commerce brand. Um, uh, traditional watch brands who have a wholesale network were not looking to um, sell watches online. We were very nervous when we, when we launched that way so we so everything we do is fairly new in that sense things move quickly so yeah two or three years is, is quite a long time in, in in the world of tech i appreciate but but um therefore we're, we're in a we're in a situation now where we're still quite early early days and we're we're actually um at the early stages of a complete site redesign and redevelopment and augmented reality will form a, a larger part of that um i'm, I'm not afraid to say it's, it's a bit of a a, a tag on feature to our existing website. It's not really built into the, to the, to the story that we're trying to tell or the way that you present our product at the moment. So yeah, for sure. We, we intend to incorporate it in a larger way um, across all products and, and, and feed it into the, to the flow of the site in a, in a slightly more seamless way. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I'm conscious we've only got about 10 minutes um, of our time remaining. So I, I think to, to sort of try and pull together a couple of the different strands of discussion that we've taken, um, we wanted to set the, the kind of the context around the pivot of change that we saw coming through during uh, 2020 and the, 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 the real acceleration that that's pushed into business environments to look at how they can leverage technology and digital innovation uh, to be able to support their business models. And I think that that's both through the frame of um, how they can survive as much as how they can thrive. And so I think that there is a, a need for organizational change to take place um, because of those imperatives. I think we were able to pick up on the fact that because we've been put into these circumstances and we've been driven to use technology engagements, the demographic shift has been quite significant in terms of the um, adoption of usage, both in terms of the traditional millennial base and, and, and other 
uh, generational zones that had been picking up with technology as a kind of a first pass for engagement, but starting to bleed into other um, areas of the market that were probably somewhat disenfranchised in terms of their use of technology platforms. And I think that the, the interesting part for uh, this discussion and as we brought the, the, the dialogue together was the speed with which organizations need to look at the implementation of individual component parts is such that uh, doing it independent of partnerships and, um, and, and, and core innovation capabilities makes it extremely difficult to translate and to transform that into a real practical market engagement capability. And so I think it's been an opportunity to give you that sort of depth of colour about very, very quick delivery of programme capabilities into market um, in real world experience and how that's translated into uh, business benefit and impact. So we've got a few minutes left, and I guess this would be an opportunity to invite any questions from the floor. Um, I'm, I'm looking through the, 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 the chat and some phenomenal uh, comments with regards to the uh, AR uh, demo that's been put up. Um, so I'm pleased that um, most of you or all of you have had the opportunity to have a look at it. I can see there's a question to David, which was, um, did you have any examples of an actual project uh, that you've run and the impact of the project? So David, if you could maybe pick that up. Yeah, sure. Um, it's really interesting because listening to Michael's comment about four minutes for high-end product, there's actually another end of the scale and that and, and we, we've got a great example of working with uh, Southern Water, actually. So, you know, a lot of people hit websites very common and they'll cut their they'll journey through the website, but the drop off rate is actually very, very high. So if, if Southern Water have got a goal, for example, in this case, it was to increase direct debit signups so more people are moving to direct debit payments. So Southern Water's brief is to get more people to click that final button that says sign up for my direct debit here, but their drop off rate was, was actually quite high. So we were, we were able to analyze every stage of the journey using our heat mapping and metrics to really tell them the, you know, how they should be looking at the creative content, how the call to action button should actually be having more, more presence on the page. And we ended up with a 33% increase in the actual uh, online direct debit customer signups. So for them, that's huge, you know, because that's moving more people to direct debit, less people on maybe the telephone having to convert the and, and convert the payments. So yeah, for them, that's and that's quite a big shift um, for you know pushing more people in a certain direction. Mm. And, and maybe just to give a bit more colour to the, the the Southern Water example, it's a client that Capita has had. Um, uh, for, for about 20 years. It's a significant uh, tenure of engagement and we've worked with them across a number of different customer experience activities and we've gradually migrated to a contract that's predicated by um, outcome generated um, uh, activities to align largely to Offwat, who's the, the regulator of the, um, the service within the marketplace. And I think that the interesting, you know, adjacent piece here, which links directly to this conversation is that it's bringing in this type of innovation and this type of partnership with Dragonfly that's been able to unlock the potential in terms of some of those real uh, tangible improvements to, the, to, to, to what was already a very good service, but really taking it to a, a different position in terms of the level of offering that we've been able to, to translate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and don't forget, that's just the online version. And maybe I can invite Jen in to talk about McDonald's, because we also did a, a fantastic case study in the offline world with, with McDonald's uh, in collaboration with Jen. Yeah, so in, in my previous role, uh, I was working really closely with McDonald's globally, but specifically in the UK around this digital transformation of their in-store. So a real live environment with some digital components, but basically you know, they went through this huge transformation, spent all this money and they had all the creative, but they were treating the creative like they had when it was a static menu board up behind a front counter instead of kind of a dynamic kiosk um, that people can interact with and can rotate and sort of animate and look amazing. Um, and so we used Dragonfly for everything. It was great. You could use it for in situ. You could take pictures of the actual creative. We could do videos and kind of figure out what people were looking at. But it really allowed us to create an experience for customers where we knew exactly what they were looking at and the, the meaning that they were getting from a piece of communication where you know, they might be seeing it for 0.3 seconds. I mean, that's on average, that was about right um, once you're in the store. So it became really important to us. If you wanna talk back to Michael's point around sort of the emotion, the art and the science of customer experience, 
we needed to be effective. We need to land the message, but we also needed to be, you know, landing an emotion for lack of a better term. I mean, it may be funny to think of a cheeseburger as emotional, but it, it can be if you're hungry. Um, so I think it was really a, an amazing tool for us to kind of get it into the business and say, look, you know, it's not just about looking at something and saying it's beautiful. It's about looking at something and understanding what's the message I want you to get from that. And how is that gonna drive action? Um, and while I would love to share some specific numbers, um, sadly I cannot, but it made a huge impact to their business. Um, I think specifically around Happy Meal and then anything that was in the in-store as well. Great, thanks, Jen. And I always get emotional when I think of a cheeseburger. It's, uh, it's... <laughs> <laughs> um, Emmanuel, I'm, I, I'm very conscious we, we, we're running with only a few minutes left. Are there any other specific questions that you've picked out that you wanna highlight um, in the short time? Thanks, Paul. There are indeed uh, a few questions, but I think we can summarize them into two main questions. And one of which was <clears throat> for Chris and the other one was for Michael. The one for Chris was, um, do you as a company, if, if you want to innovate and, 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 uh, and create a new offering for your product as an established company, what is better? Do you do this in-house or do you try, as you said, find someone who is already established in the market can offer a good product? And um, this question, by the way, came from several established firms in the audience who were looking at, you know, do we invest our own money in our own people or do we try to buy in an existing product? That was the question for Chris. And the second question I picked up was for Michael. Um, uh, people loved your prediction in terms of what the future may hold in terms of clothing potentially be a difficult one, but uh, Louis Vuitton uh, bag, not really. Um, there was more interest in your predictions. Where are we in five or 10 years? You know, what, how do we purchase things and what do we purchase where? So two big, bigger questions for Michael and Chris. Okay, yeah, so I'll go first. So building the team or, or using outsource partners. Um, uh, we came up with this, uh, uh, um, we discussed this internally recently, uh, took to go quite at length. Um, we, we've ended up coming to the conclusion that you very much need a an established skeleton of talent in 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 house. You've got to have an understanding for the technology that you're looking to use. You've got to have some idea about where you wish to go to hold everything together, and then supplement that with high quality agencies. Because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. uh, agencies or partners, um, you it's, it's impossible to think that you can be an expert in everything. I mean, if so I if I take really, watch me, it's, it's a mix, isn't it? Has um, to be a mix. Okay. Has to be a mix, but you've got to have a strong skeleton internal um, team who can handle these partners, can speak the language, and can work with them. Mm, I think with that, you have a good base to build on. If you try and um, outsource everything, they won't necessarily understand your brand, understand mm. your priorities, um, and yeah, the. So the truth is, is it's the answers both, but um, it's important to have a high quality uh, kind of exco skeleton of um of talent within the business to supplement. Important agent. answer because you pretty much say it can go wrong either way. If you outsource everything, it can go wrong, and if you try to do uh, do it on your own, and maybe spending years and years and years on developing something that already exists in the market, then you may lose valuable time. Mm. So it's a, it's yeah, take it. shortcuts. Take uh, when they're there, take shortcuts. You use other people to help you make those leaps. So that I question, by the way, came from Uprose and Knight Frank. So thanks so much um, to our colleagues who posed that question. And the second question was uh, for Michael on where are we in five years and 10 years and what do we buy and where? Yeah, I would say like uh, the, the only sensible, like nobody knows the future, right? But there's a few things that have a really high probability of happening. Like, as I say, artificial intelligence will change how we live our life and it will change the world. And it will become smarter than us at a certain point of time, and et cetera, et cetera. So those things we kind of like know, they haven't happened yet, and nobody can predict the future, but we know them with a high probability. The same with augmented reality. If you have the notion of you can superimpose anything anywhere at any time without the use of this one, that's a pretty compelling offer. And I would reckon that in the next decade, around a decade from now, this doesn't exist no more. Yeah, so how do you then engage with all the digital stuff? And it's not necessary we all get an implant and we get Neuralink into our brain, but there will be, uh, it will not be a phone in your pocket. It will be something different. And it might be a light projection and it might be um, a contact lens. You know, the contact lens is the one my brain understands the easiest, but I also know that there will be things that my brain don't understand today that will come. So I would say like, prediction of AI in general is just like get going because it will be everywhere just like 
the first uh, people who start trading e-commerce online. You know, they were pioneers back then, but they uh, gained a lot of market share. And now everybody's doing it. And the same goes for AR. So I would say, take the opportunity. You have a good partnership here with Capita and British uh, American business. You know, you get the verification of big corporates. You get all the security that comes with that. And you get uh, fresh uh, smart startups like uh, Dragonfly and London Dynamics. Perfect. I think we've run perfectly to time there. So thank you to everybody uh, who was able to contribute today. And thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this discussion today. Uh, Emmanuel, I'll pass to you if there's any final words. Just to say thank you very much to Capita. Thank you so much to our speakers and again to this extremely diverse group. Uh, I'm still at all a little bit extremely fascinating. I think we need to process that and get back to you, Michael, in a few years and see whether we still have something else than this um, around um it's going to be an interesting future in any case good to see you all and thanks so much and again thanks to the two teams who put this all together i know there will be a follow-up um for us to stay in touch and to learn more and thank you for the brave ones who turn on the cameras i really appreciate it it's nice to see somebody out there yeah. <laughs> that's a good point yes